Hello and welcome to the latest BitGardener web seminar. Uh, my name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at BitGardener and like to welcome you. Um, today we're talking about media milling, um, taking a deep dive into it. Um, this is really the second part of our uh, dispersion series. The first part that uh, we ran, it was probably three, four weeks ago. Um, also, uh, if, if you missed that, if you're interested in that, we do have a YouTube channel. Um, we'll send you a uh, email with that link so you can check out uh, previous recordings. But for today, um, our format, it's a, a longer presentation than our office hours, 40, 45 minutes, uh, then followed by questions and answers. Uh, if you do have any questions, please log them in the chat box. And, uh... Hi, Andy. And then uh, also we are recording this immediately following the presentation. You'll receive an automated link with that recording. Feel free to uh, share it with colleagues, uh, watch again later. Um, it's, it's great for date night, I hear too. So you know, <laughs> whatever works for you. Uh, our presenter today is our uh, dispersion expert within the organization, uh, Mr. Andy Stumer. He is our business line uh, manager uh, for dispersion. So Andy, there it is, sir. Uh, it's all yours. Take it away. Hey, John, thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, like John said, this is the second part of our uh, milling seminar or dispersion seminar, and uh, we'll cover this in a little bit more in depth. And at the end of the presentation, uh, please feel free to ask questions, and hopefully we'll get through all of them. Uh, but uh, we're going to start with a quick introduction about the uh, company. So we're going to then dive right into the dispersion process. Just a quick uh, overview, uh, not too much in depth, just a little refresh about the first part of the dispersion process before we talk about actually the milling part. And then we're going to recover the lab and production equipment capabilities that uh, we offer, uh, quality control, as well as standard lab uh, capabilities in our Wallingford or German facility. Um, so let's go through it. As you can see in the slide right here, we cover everything uh, from small lab space all the way up to pilot and to uh, manufacturing. There was actually much larger manufacturing units, but they just didn't fit on, on that particular slide. Um, so the company VMA uh, is a German company. They were founded by Hermann Getzmann, his beautiful wife up on the top right uh, in 1972. Um, he actually was a co-founder of Anton Parr. He decided that he would want to start his own company and uh, sold out and basically uh, started the uh, VMA Getzman company in uh, Reichshof, Germany, which is about 30 miles east of Cologne. Um, the very first dispermat um, down below here was designed or manufactured in 1973. Uh, believe it or not, there are still some customers that are still using the original dispermats. Uh, the motors are direct drive. They're brushless. There is no belts. Um, so they are really low maintenance and uh, will last a lifetime. And also very, very quiet because of the design. The only um, uh, component that some of these customers had to replace that are still running on the original units were actually the control box that you can see right here, that's the original one. So they updated those. Uh, we had a number of customers recently that did that, but they're still running, believe it or not, on the original dispermats. Um, Big has had the exclusive distribution rights for US and Canada since 1988. The way this started was we uh, brought some over to our big uh, additives facilities to use in our applications laboratory. And we had customers come in and review uh, the process and they were asking about the dispermats. And that's when Dr. Peter came up with the idea to actually bring them over to the US and offer them through our big uh, instruments division or big garden as some of you are probably familiar with. Um, and that's uh, how we got uh, that product line introduced here in uh, North America. The company is still owned by the same family. Uh, the two kids, Christian and Martin are now running it. Um, they have about 100 employees, actually a little bit over uh, 100 now. They added some more designers. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see that some of the added capabilities. But they are known to make high-end dissolvers, bead mills, 
basket mills for the lab space pilot and as well as manufacturing environment. So that building here in the middle, that back part is actually new. So they added two floors and added more design capability and more manufacturing space. Uh, one of the things that uh, makes VMA Getsman a standout is that about 40% of everything that they build is custom. So we have a lot of different customers with, from different end use markets with different requirements and uh, we're able to satisfy a lot of these different needs uh, with uh, by making custom designs of the equipment. Um, and then we have the, st the state of the art dispersion lab here in Wallingford where I'm at today as well as in uh, Reichshof, Germany at the headquarters. So that lab is right up here, second floor. Um, so just a quick overview. So why are we dispersing? Uh, obviously it came out of the coatings world, uh, has since branched out to many different, what we call end use markets, but basically it came out of the coatings world and to really disperse different types of pigments. So we differentiate there between the organic pigments, inorganics functional, and then some of the newer, uh, special effect pigments, as you know, in a lot of your cosmetics or, or automotive applications like the silver paints, um, a lot more care has to be taken because we don't want to destroy these special effect pigments if we t put too much here, or, you know, with the media, sometimes they get destroyed and that's what we want to avoid um, to really just maintain uh, the pigment integrity. Uh, the goal is really to uh, improve our gloss transparency, have better color stability, tectural strength, or cleanliness of shades are some of the attributes that we're looking for when we're properly dispersing our, our mill base. Um, so the goals are really to improve our wetting. That's the first step. Uh, we want to break up these invisible electromagnetic forces. They're called Van der Waals forces. They are binding forces that hold our pigment particles together. Uh, and the goal is really to reduce them ideally to the primary back to the primary particle size, which will give us improved color, a better gloss. Um, we'll have as a result overall improved appearance. Uh, we're going to save money because we're going to be more efficient in our process. We'll need less pigment the finer we disperse. Uh, so that's a cost saving mechanism. Um, again, wrong, reduced raw material costs. Uh, we're going to have better product consistency. It's going to help us improve our formulation. A more consistent particle size distribution is also a net result of proper dispersing. And then obviously we want to get really good upscale results from the lab to pilot and then all the way up to manufacturing. <clears throat> so some of the issues that come up, uh, if we do a poor job dispersing our pigments or particles, we're going to have very poor Stability, we're going to have maybe shift in our color. That comes up a lot, flocculation of pigments where they just bind back together and uh, then they, don't, they settle out so they don't have any shelf life. Uh, sagging, leveling, settling is another issue there. Uh, reduce glass levels or the separation could be another issue if we poorly disperse. But I want to also stress uh, Proper dispersion process is only one part of the equation. We also need to add the right additives uh, to make sure that um, we have a properly formulated product and it stays that way, uh, not that it uh, changes after storing. So it's really important to remember that um, we want to have good stability. Uh, so pigments that require strong color fastness uh, to reduce fading over time. So that's really important. Uh, brightness, this will provide the best color usually. Uh, the rule of thumb for pigment size is that the smaller uh, the, 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 the particles that will improve our transparency, will get better color. And obviously we'll need less of the pigment in our formulation, helping us to save money, which uh, our accountants really like to hear or the purchasing department. And then uh, viscosity also uh, plays a big role. So the lower the viscosity, usually is better doing our dispersing or milling process, but we don't want to uh, go too low uh, because we don't, uh, um, we want to be able to put enough, enough energy. 
And if our uh, mill base has the viscosity, let's say, of water, uh, we need to add even more beads when we put in more time or more energy uh, to really process the material. So there is a sweet spot, and we're looking anywhere between three, maybe to 10,000 centipoise is really what we call optimization of the mill base. And that's usually where we want to be in order to properly disperse or mill our material. If we get too high with our viscosity, we run into the problem that we, we won't be able to uh, properly move the material in the container. If we horizontally mill, we won't be able to properly push or put the material through our horizontal meet, uh, milling chamber. Uh, if we want to use a basket mill and the viscosity is too high, then we're going to have a problem with the flow of the material in and out of the basket. So we always want to make sure that we maintain a good range of our viscosity to make sure the product is flowable. So it's therefore very important to uh, remember that we are only trying to reduce our particle size and not destroy our particles. That is not the goal of uh, dispersing and milling. Uh, our agglomerates and the smaller clusters, we call them aggregates, they are really reduced to primary particle size and only uh, the shear forces are responsible for that separation, uh, nothing else. And then at the end, we want to select the right additives to keep the primary particles in a suspended state and uh, have a good looking product. So here's just an example of uh, different pigment types and what that looks like uh, in terms of particle size, uh, just to give you an idea of what that looks like under the microscope. And I really like this slide a lot because it kind of shows uh, what's happening here. So we have these larger building blocks. These are these clusters that are held together by these uh, Van der Waal forces. We call them agglomerates. And ideally, what we want to do is we want to reduce those, uh, break up these binding forces and reduce the size of these blocks and turn them into aggregates. Uh, in order for go, to go from the agglomerate level to the aggregate level, we need to use a, a cowl's blade or an impeller uh, disc. That will help us get there. To go from the aggregate level down to the primary particle size, the impeller or the cowl's blade no longer gives us sufficient shear so therefore, we need to do what's called medium milling. That's what we'll talk about today. And that's that step from the aggregate down to the primary particle level, where we need to use media and a milling disk and different types of milling systems uh, that are available to get, to get that job done. So the first step is we need to wet our solid particles. That's why that uh, dispersion, uh, pre-dispersion process is so important. Uh, it allows us to mechanically break down these agglomerates and then turn them into aggregates. And then uh, furthermore, for milling, we go uh, then down to the primary particle size. And at the end, we want to stabilize our particles again with the right um, additive for your formulation. So here is also a good slide just showing you the entire dispersion process. So we start out with the blade. Uh, that's where we wet our particles and break up these larger agglomerates. And then when we want to go to the fine uh, particle size, we need to do the milling. Uh, in this case, you see a horizontal rotor. Uh, there's other milling options. And then basically that allows us to break down the particles uh, really fine. Um, even nano range is not a problem. And then we want to stabilize it. <clears throat> so this slide is kind of a Good slide in showing you or outlining at what point um, you're gonna or you should move over to a media mill. So you start out, let's say, with a very coarse material, and then you can use a dissolver around 20 to 30 to 10 microns in that range. Uh, at that point, you should start me media milling. That's when when you're more efficient. And as you can see, the dissolver stops at around 10 microns. And then we're not really putting in more enough shear anymore to really help us go down to uh, the sub micron range or small micron range where we want to end up. We need to really uh, medium mill. Uh, so for the predispersion process, it's important to remember it's not only the RPMs that's only one part of the equation. 
uh, what we're really looking for is the actual tape speed uh, because the RPMs are just only one variable. Uh, but it, what really matters is how, what is the diameter of your blade and what is the actual tape speed. So we want to be between 18 to 25 meters per second uh, to use a dissolver. So we have different types of dispomats. And then for fine dispersing and milling, uh, we want to use our uh, either basket mill, a vertical bead mill, or a horizontal mill. And then the tape speed should be anywhere between 10 to 16 meters per second. That's when we are media milling. That's really important. These are, are um, numbers that are derived from many, many years of uh, trialing different formulations, identifying what gives us the best milling results over time. Uh, so these are really, really good numbers. Um, so just briefly, uh, before we mill, we want to also make sure that our for our pre-dispersion process, our dissolver blade is in the right uh, <clears throat> uh, ratio with our container. So we have uh, on the right, here's a good example of the different container sizes uh, down here. And then what type of blade you could use depending on the container side and, and also depending on the viscosity that you're running. So there is not one blade that fits all. So you have actually quite a bit of uh, flexibility in terms of what blade diameter you want to choose for your vessel size. <clears throat> and here is the important uh, calculation uh, formula to calculate our tape speed. So we have pi multiplied by the diameter of our milling disk by the RPM or the shaft speed. Uh, if we want to get meters per second how it's displayed on our machines, we want to divide everything by 60, but keep in mind that to express the diameter of our blade, we want to use metric and in um, meters. So if let's say we have a 50 millimeter blade, we want to uh, use 0 0.05 in that case, uh, multiply that with pi and the RPMs and then divide that by 60. That will give us our actual tape speed in meters per second, which, uh, we're, we're, which uh, should be anywhere between uh, 18 to 25 meters per second for pre-dispersion or 10 to 16 meters when we actually uh, media milling. That's a really good formula on our higher end models like the AE or the CA that is already calculated and shown on the display. On the more uh, lower end or medium uh, uh, models, uh, that number it has to be calculated. So here is the donut effect, very important. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a second, but we want to optimize our dispersion before we go actually into the milling process. So duration of the dispersion is important, usually anywhere between 5 to 15 minutes, depending on your mill base that gives us really good wetting. <clears throat> we want to see a donut effect. That's the visual cue that we see when we look inside of a container. Uh, that it actually looks like a donut, then we know we are actually optimizing our predispersion process of 18 to 25 meters per second. So if the viscosity is in the range I talked earlier, about three to 10,000 centipoise, and we stay within the tape speed range, we'll have a really good looking donut, and we would know that we are properly uh, dispersing our material. <clears throat> then again, the geometric consideration. So we want to use the right diameter blade uh, container ratio. Uh, we also want to use the right type of impeller disc. There's different types out there for different viscosities. Mill base should be about 50% fill ratio of our container. We don't want to go more, much more. We can go up to 70 maximum. But if we go higher, we have an issue with potentially spilling, especially if we add a lot of shear force. Um, from a formulation standpoint, Pigment and filler concentration play a big part. We want to keep the temperature as low as possible, especially when we're dealing with solvent-based materials. We don't want to flash off all the solvent. We want to keep it in our mill base, so we try to keep the temperature lower. And then again, we want to choose the right additives for better wetting, dispersing, and no flocculation of our pigments. And then when we have the right particle size, that's when we actually should start uh, the medium milling process. 
So the difference here between the dissolver and the bead mill, as you probably already know, our, our dissolvers, they're called disper mats. You can use them for both dispersing as well as milling. That what makes them really unique. Uh, and uh, so when you use them as a dissolver, that's the first step in the dispersion process, pre-dispersion. Uh, we can only apply limited amount of energy because of the blade. Uh, that means limited shear force. It's really only there to deagglomerate, not to break up the aggregates to get down to the primary particle size. And it is a necessary step for any proper dispersion to do before you're starting to mill. Um, not saying I learn something new every day. In some cases, you can do it, uh, but it's not advisable because you get much better wetting when you use a dispersion blade. Um, so the process to do it correctly would be to first pre-disperse, uh, make sure you get to the right particle size range, and then uh, you want to start milling. You will find that milling will also be more efficient if you have the right particle size to start with. Uh, and then if you only use a dissolver and no, no medium mill, your color strength would be limited. For example, poor gloss, hay, some of these issues we talked earlier could be a factor if we are not uh, milling. Now in our medium mills, we can put in a lot more energy. Uh, we really break down the particles to sub microns if we want to a low micron range, primary particle size, and that will give us a much better looking product not only better color strength and transparency, particle size distribution, but I want to also add probably better mechanical uh, properties as well uh, if we do a better uh, dispersion job, uh, uh, milling job. So what actually happens in a bead mill? So as you know, we use media that is either zirconia based, some people use glass, which we don't recommend uh, for various reasons. We'll cover that in a minute here. But these beads are perfectly round under the microscope, or at least they should be. Uh, if they are not, then uh, maybe you need to look for a different supplier uh, because it's really important that you have high quality zirconium beads, uh, either cerium stabilized or yttrium treated. Uh, there's the ones are white and then the other ones are brownish in color. Um, but that is uh, really important that they are perfectly spherical. So as you're milling inside of your milling chamber, it's a basket mill or if it's a uh, bead, uh, horizontal bead mill, these beads drift around your slurry at very high velocities and they get pushed towards each other and then they drift away from each other at really high velocities. So that drifting action is actually what's producing the shear. So think about it this way. If you, you know the rubber duck uh, uh, syndrome in the bathtub, as you try to squeeze that rubber duck and it always tries to escape your hands, it's very hard to actually catch. That's exactly what's happening inside of a bead mill, except at much higher speeds, a lot more force. And that, that action with, as the beads drift towards each other is causing these particles to just shear away and, and, and break up these binding forces. That's really what's happening inside of a bead mill. We are not trying to crush our pigment particles. We're only trying to break up these binding forces. That's really all that we are trying to do. And that's what's really happening inside of a bead mill. Actually, the probability of a pigment particle to be wedged in between two beads at the same time when they're colliding is very, very slim because of the fluid dynamics that they are getting pushed away. So really that pushing action is the force that's causing the breakup of these binding forces. That's what's really happening there. So kinetic energy is very important. Uh, maybe uh, we'll, we, I don't, you don't have to write it down, but we'll talk about that in uh, why that is important. Um, and then you can download the presentation um, later so you, you'll have that formula if you want to figure out the kinetic energy. Uh, but the reason it's important is because different beads have different weights. And the reason we want to use ceramic beads and not glass beads is because they have a higher specific gravity. They are heavier, the same size. Uh, so imagine I'm trying, if you're trying to drive that nail into the board, 
using a very small hammer. It sometimes may be impossible to drive the nail in the board because you don't have enough kinetic energy to really get the nail down into the board. If I use a sledgehammer, it takes me one blow and that be, that nail will be in the board, right? So it really is about selecting the correct uh, uh, diameter or, or, or bead size to really properly, um, you know, disperse or mill our material. But that's kind of like the same thing. So uh, in the milling process, so therefore we always want to get beads that are heavier. That means we have more kinetic energy and that will give us more milling action and more efficient milling action. So if you compare glass, you have a specific weight of 2.5 the serum stabilized zirconia is 6.1, almost three times as heavy, right? Um, so that alone will tell me that I have a lot more milling action with my zirconia bead than with my glass beads. The other problem is the hardness, right? So my Vico hardness is 1150 on my zirconia. On my glass, it's only 400. What, that, what does that do? During the milling process, obviously, there's a lot of shear. The, mid, the beads get thrown against the milling chamber. Uh, some beads collide. Uh, they impact with the rotor. So over time, either they wear, wear down or they will also break. We haven't seen really zirconium beads break, but we have seen glass beads break all the time. And then what happens is you have, uh, sh you end up with shards of your glass inside of your mill base not very good it, it uh you know it um contaminates your slurry uh you have uneven processing parameters because you can no longer guarantee that all the media is the same size so if you try to rep replicate a process it's difficult to do with glass um, you have to recycle them a lot more often than zirconium uh, the only upside to using glass is they're quite a bit cheaper but not nearly as effective as zirconium. Therefore, we don't sell glass and we advise against glass beads <clears throat> for these differences uh, compared to, or problems compared to zirconium. So I like this slide a lot because it shows you the uh, actual what's happening when these beads uh, in the milling chambers. You have large beads, right? And the small particle right there on the, in kind of the center is actually a, 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 an agglomerate or an aggregate. And we're trying to break that up. So by that shearing action, that it's actually happening right in these corners right there. So if we have beads that are too big and our particles are too small, it's very difficult for them to shear properly. Uh, that's why you have to adjust and dial in the right media size compared to your starting particle size. Uh, it's, you know, not impossible, but it's, a, it's not great to use. The, if the beads are too small and your particles are too big, again, the kinetic energy comes into play. You're not going to be able to really break up these binding forces because your particles are too large, the beads are too small, not enough energy. But the opposite could also happen if your beads are too big, then the area where they're supposed to be sheared uh, is too big. So therefore that energy gets lost and therefore you have diminished milling results as, as a result of, of, of that. Uh, that's, the, that's the downside of having beads that are too big. So these are some of the key uh, <clears throat> elements that are really important to remember uh, when we're milling. So particle size after the predispersion process with the dissolver, again, 10 microns is really your threshold there. We can't really go any lower or we're not properly uh, uh, breaking up the particle size. Bead size and weight, again, kinetic energy. We want to use the right size beads. Um, the bead type, stay away from glass. Um, the volume of the beads, depending on if you're using a vertical bead mill, you can have, add a lot more beads, up to 100% of mill base. 
if you have a basket mill, you have maybe half of that uh, volume. Uh, then you also have a horizontal bead mill, depending on the milling chamber volume, but you also have a certain amount of beads uh, that are required to uh, have proper milling. And different uh, horizontal mills have different bead requirements. So that would be something you can find in, in your manual. The shape of beads, they're important. We always want them to be perfectly round, not ed no edges. So they should be really spherical. Um, again, stay away from cheap, inexpensive beads. We have seen uh, cases where people buy them or will get a sample. And then the supplier, when they order the first lot, the sample looked totally different than the actual lot that they order. And they are no longer very um, balanced and round. They now have edges and they're not ideal for milling. Uh, again, when we are milling, our tape speed should be about 10 to 16 meters per second. Again, the calculation for tape speed is the RPM multiplied with pi times the diameter of your milling rotor and metric. Um, so let's say it's a 50 millimeter rotor times 0 0.05 and divide everything by 60. That will give you the correct tape speed. Uh, product temperature, really important. Uh, try to stay as cool as possible, especially when we are milling. We're putting in a lot of energy and therefore we really need to maintain a proper uh, temperature in our milling chamber or a supply vessel. They all have all cooling jackets to really ensure proper uh, temperature control of our mill base. Uh, energy input is very important. How much energy I'm putting in. So either it's increase in speed or just increase in energy. We can on some of our models, we can um, select the uh, amount of energy we are putting in instead of speed. So as your viscosity changes during the milling process, the machine uh, would automatically adjust the speed to always maintain the same energy that you're selecting. Let's say you want to mill with 1000 watts of energy, then it automatically adjusts the speed to always maintain the 1000 watts of energy irrespective of your viscosity change. Um, number of passes, how often does it go a cycle through my basket mill or my horizontal medium mill? Uh, milling time, very important. How long am I milling? We have cases where, you know, we need to mill for hours on end. And then we have cases where five minutes of milling time is already enough to give us the proper particle size. Depends really on your mill base and formulation uh, that, uh, is, is, you know, impacts that, that parameter. Uh, again, the viscosity is very critical. If we are too low in our viscosity, then we have a problem putting in enough energy. If our viscosity is too high, then we're having a problem with flow of the material through our milling chamber or our basket mill. Uh, so again, milling diameter of our milling tool is also important. Um, we want to uh, select the proper diameter uh, that gives us that gives us the best ratio to our milling chamber. Um, the type of material we select. So we have anything from stainless steel, hard steel, ceramic to also polyurethane or other materials. I want to stress that milling is very abrasive, especially if you are milling white materials. You can have an issue with this coloration where you will see all of a sudden gray appear in your slurry. Uh, we just recently saw that again with the customer and it's really a matter of using them uh, on white colors, uh, zirconium light milling chamber, white ceramic to avoid any type of uh, discoloration of our mill base. Uh, unfortunately, this is unavoidable uh, if you're using stainless steel as the media would, uh, you know, hit the container walls or, or the milling chamber and they will wear down that, that metal tiny particles into carry over into your slurry. So if you want to have good color stability, I highly recommend or we highly recommend that you use uh, uh, ceramic uh, components. And then again, different media mill designs, depending on what 
the application calls for. So we have vertical mills, horizontal. Uh, also, we have a basket mill design, depending different applications require different types of bead mills. Uh, so just a quick slide to show you the uh, benefit that this format right here is the Dispermat AE. It can function also as a rotor stator. Uh, you can add a vacuum system. We can add a basket mill system, a wall scraping system for really viscous and thick materials. And we can also integrate a vertical bead mill called the APS, stands for air pressure system, that is also a milling system that will fit right onto our dispermat. Uh, so one machine fits all the different needs for different applications. So it can be used as a, a homogenizer, like as a mixer to blend two different liquids together with different uh, attachments, either a butterfly or a propeller tool. We can also use it with the rotor stata as an emulsifier uh, to blend one liquid into another liquid that's non-soluble at a very high shear rate uh, that's called emulsifying or as a disperser where we are actually breaking down the particles what we're talking about today and use it or use it as a dissolver or with a milling disc or a basket mill as a media mill so very functional so what's happening inside of our basket mill <clears throat> so on top, first of all, you see it's a it's a batch process. It's not continuous like you would have on a horizontal media mill. So there is a limitation as to how much volume you can process per trial. Um, you have your uh, your basket mill um, on the on the top. There's an inlet. Right below the inlet is a pumping wheel, and below the pumping wheel we have a milling disc. Um, and then underneath the milling disc, we also have a screen. And below the screen, we have a cowl's blade. So the cowl's blade is not there to disperse the material. It's there to really suck the mill base out of the mill through the screen and then pump it back around to the top, where then that pumping wheel takes over and sucks it back into the basket. So you have very good movement of your mill base in and out of the basket. So that gives you many, many cycles through the basket mill and is very, very efficient. Um, provided that I have also good viscosity. And I imagine if my viscosity is too high, then my material would cake up right here and I have no way of moving the product into my basket mill. Or it's not moving at all. If it's very thick, so tropic, we have seen the material kind of stagnant around these bars right here and not moving properly, then it's also very difficult to use that type of a media mill. Um, however, if we have good flow, a, a basket mill is a really good alternative to uh, a horizontal media mill or a vertical bead mill because it's very easy to operate, also very easy to clean, uh, and we get very efficient milling results. As a matter of fact, we can go down to about 500 nanometers with the standard uh, TML, we call it the uh, our basket mill system. Uh, if we want to go lower, then we really need to use either horizontal media mill or a vertical bead mill. Uh, you can see cooling is very important because of uh, you know the, all the energy we are putting in. So we have here a double walled milling chamber and these bars right here, they're actually cooling lines as well so we have water or coolant in going through the basket all around and then coming back up the other way so therefore we always maintain really good temperature inside of our milling basket we also offer a nano kit uh, with a different mesh size for very small media and that basically allows us to really mill down the material super super small into the mid to low nano range also very easy to clean. So here is a great slide showing you the milling action. Uh, we draw our mill base into the container. You can see our media is already in here. You didn't see that on the previous slide. If I forgot to mention that, I apologize. But you also fill uh, 
you have to fill in the uh, the uh, mailing chamber here with media. So that comes in from the top. And then here you can see the media on this slide right here. Okay, again, sucking it out of the, of the basket, the screen here keeps the media in place and then we'll bring it to the top where then we rotate it in and out of the basket. That's the benefit of a, of a basket mill. Very good, efficient milling. This is a larger uh, production size uh, basket mill. Our, our bead loading is right here where that screw sits. We remove the screw, we take a funnel, and then we feed the beads right into that uh, gap right there. Um, and that's the uh, production size basket mill. So it's a batch system. It's a very simple design. Uh, we don't have any bearings, uh, no lip seals, no O-rings that can wear out. So it's very easy to maintain compared to a horizontal media mill where we have all these different you know, components that we have to swap out. Here, you don't really have to do much except sometimes replace the milling disc and the pumping wheel. And occasion maybe the screen wears out, but this—that's the only thing you need to replace. Uh, but not often, depending obviously on how much you mill. But the, for example, my lab here—I mill quite a bit, and I have yet to replace the uh, milling disc or the pumping wheel or the screen on my media mill that's four years old. Um, uh, with the DL shaft, that's the attachment that. Uh, goes onto our dispermat that would allow you to mill and disperse with one machine. So you go back and forth like that bayonet style quick change system. Uh, very easy to handle. Uh, the, the baskets again, all double walled for proper cooling, except the smallest one, the Team LO5. Unfortunately, we don't have cooling capabilities. You just have to cool the, the, through the container, which needs to be double walled as well. Uh, and then we can have that nano cake for very small uh, media if, if you want to mill down that small nano range. Uh, then we can go into manufacturing. We can go all the way up to 2,000 liters of material. A very quick uh, product change. We have what's called a quick change system, QCS for manufacturing, where we can go very quick from one basket to another basket. So if you're running multiple color families, it's very quick and easy to replace that. Um, we have a vacuum system. Also, if you want to mill under vacuum, that's sometimes helpful. Uh, if you want to remove the air, you get a little bit more milling efficiency. Imagine that air bubbles are tiny little air mattresses and the beads that impact, um, you know, those, they act like little buffers. Uh, to, to uh, reduce the milling efficiency. Here is a great system called the TML. Uh, that's for manufacturing. That's a two-in-one system. So you have a, uh, your cow split is right back here. So you can disperse and mill all on one machine. Very, very efficient. You don't have to replace the basket. This is great if you're only producing one color and you want to do a reasonable volume and you don't want to change colors. This is excellent because you pre-disperse. When you're ready to mill, you push the button on the control board and then the basket comes down and now you have a fully functioning media mill. You don't have to make any changes whatsoever. Very, very efficient. Uh, vertical bead mill, APS, that's really for smaller volumes. Uh, that's a lab scale model right here. That again would fit up onto our disper mat. Here is our milling disc. We have a cover. We have a container that is uh, separated uh, with the screen on the bottom and a drain plug. And then we have a container below. It sits on a stand, but for um, sake of understanding this picture, they had to remove one of the legs so you can actually see what it properly looks like. Uh, but rest assured, if you purchase one, it has four legs. Um, so the top container, has a screen on the bottom with the drain plug. So you will do your pre-dispersion in here. You just have to use a cowl blade instead of a milling disc. And when you're ready to do milling, you just pop on the milling disc, you add your beads, 
put down the lid and then you're milling. When you're ready to, to uh, remove your material, you hook up an air hose right here to the cover and pressurize your container and then remove the drain plug. And then you're basically purging your mill base or slurry out of the container into the container below. That's a really nice way of milling. Uh, it only keeps the beads back in here. Then you add water or cleaning fluid, whatever you're using, put the cover back on, and then you basically run it for a few minutes, rinse and repeat. That's how you're actually cleaning um, the APS system. So it's very easy to clean, very easy to maintain. Again, like the basket mill, no real lip seal, no O-rings, you know, any type of wearables like that you would have with the horizontal bead mill. Here, you don't have really any variables, only your screen on the bottom. Uh, we offer those APS systems also in ceramic configuration, so ceramic light milling chamber. Again, if you're just using stainless steel and you're running a white color, then you can have uh, gray ending up in your slurry uh, coming from the actual container wall that will then impact the color of your material. So here is kind of a, a, a graph that shows you what that looks like with the drain plug. It's very easy to remove. Here is your slur with your media, your milling disc. And when you're ready to purge the material, just hook up that air hose to the socket, remove the drain plug, and then very nicely you can remove your mill base into the container below. So using air pressure for that, uh, we can go up to seven liter container. We have made custom versions up to 30 liters, which is about um, eight, ga eight gallons. And uh, we also uh, have obviously, the, like I explained, different configurations for ceramic, uh, if you wanna get that line. And you can add 50% uh, of uh, material and 50% of beads. So you have 100% bead loading with respect to your uh, uh, mill base. And that's a very, very high bead loading, very good milling efficiency, uh, able to go down to nano range, very narrow particle size distribution. Uh, the only issue is if you wanna make more than let's say 30 liters, it gets difficult because of handling, uh, because you need so many beads. So therefore, this is not really something we recommend for large scale production, maybe pilot at the most, uh, but really more designed for lab scale to really prove out a concept and see what kind of pigment, you know, concentration and so on works best in that formulation. And I want to do a quick, quick milling and easy cleaning so that's really really uh designed for that it does a great job but we have customers that use it for small volume production like pilot like up to 30 liters we have made custom systems okay here's another slide so different milling discs are available uh <clears throat> again they fit right onto our dispermats from vma uh, we can do very, very small volume with the lowest APS down to 12 milliliters, very fast, easy cleaning. Uh, you can use a range of viscosities, even very thick viscosities work really well with the APS. We can get a, uh, a nano screen. Um, we can uh, get ceramic again. It's great for R&D and QC, not so much for production because of the handling. Uh, again, easy cleaning and easy uh, handling for quick color changes, but not production. And here are just examples of our horizontal bead mills. So that's the SL. We have that in our laboratory in Wallingford. That's more of a large scale production horizontal mill. So the way it works, we have our supply vessel right here. On top of it is our agitator and pumping wheel. So that basically pumps the slurry that's in here down into our milling chamber. That's where we have our rotor. And then we basically circulate the product back into our milling chambers. We have a really 
good circulation in and out of the supply vessel into the milling chain and back around. You can also set it up for pass through mode. So you can just go through it once and then put it to an, another mill with maybe smaller beads or you are done already after one pass. Uh, unlikely, but there are some products that might uh, behave that way. <clears throat> so either pass or recirculation method on a horizontal medium mill. The pumping uh, system is integrated, so that's really nice. Uh, we can go up to 6,000 RPM. Uh, the uh, independent control of our rotor and pumping speed. We have offer also different linings, ceramic, hard metal, stainless steel is standard. Sometimes we have customers that want polyurethane. Uh, they want a softer material. Uh, we can use a different range of uh, media sizes. We use also a dynamic gap on ours. We don't use a screen to separate the media from the slurry. We actually have a dynamic gap. It's basically a machined, uh, looks like a little um, flange that goes in there. And that basically keeps the beads that are larger than that gap back in, in the milling chamber. Um, so that helps with uh, screen wear and is generally an improvement in design of our horizontal media mill. Um, and then you can also get a nano kit. If you want to go to sub 100 nanometers, you can't do it with the standard. You really need the small media and the nano uh, components for that. Uh, quality control briefly. So we have different control capabilities. Here on the right is just standard uh, RPM, amperage, temperature. That's more manufacturing. What we have here, uh, what's called our C technology we have a lot more features on our screen. On top left, you see the RPM. We have the energy in watts. Uh, below that, we have our, actually our torque value in Newton meters. We get our tip speed display. That's really important. Temperature and timer function. So we can also program recipes. We call them at a later time. So a lot of different capabilities with that technology. And then we have the ability to also on the higher end models for production to program our own process if you want to integrate a scale. So there is different uh, programmable uh, capabilities that we offer. Also, lead time, I think, is a year on that Siemens controller. So not, not very advisable. Uh, we can program cutoff values with our higher end model, meaning that let's say if we want to uh, we don't want our material to exceed a certain temperature. Uh, we can program a value, a number of values, and say warning. Let's say we want to have a cutoff at 80 C. Uh, we can warn at 50 or 60, at 70, and then at 80, it shuts off the machine. Or we can program it to run at a different speed. Uh, we can do net power calibration as the machines run without any product. They're already consuming energy. And they are actually using power to operate. So if you're looking at the energy uh, and you want to do a zero calibration, you can do that. And that means you run it for about 20 seconds. And then it basically takes all the values it needs to operate itself with a product out of the equation. And then you'll know that all the values that are displayed are strictly related to your product. We can also send the data over to a computer. This is the 2007 version. We don't have the new one ready yet. It's called Windisp. That's why this looks dated. But there is a more up-to-date version as well uh, that's coming out called Windisp. Uh, I think Windisp 11. Uh, we have a lab space in Germany. That's our BMA headquarters. A lot of good capability to try different things. Uh, with different types of equipment. And we have one in Wallingford, Connecticut, where we added new capabilities. So you can see back here all the different attachments. We also have a horizontal media mill back here. So here's some of the new uh, equipment that we have in our, our Wallingford lab. The latest AE, which is our flagship product for uh, dispersing and milling with the basket mill or vertical bead mill. And we also have our horizontal media mill. And so you can come to Wallingford to see the lab, try out uh, experiments, run 
your material and our equipment. Uh, we can also include our chemists from our different end use markets to give you maybe some formulation support if you re need that or are looking for that. Uh, we have those resources available. That said, speak apart from some of the competition. We're not just a hardware company, we're really a company that comes in and wants to offer a turnkey solution to help you get a better product um, and, and, and have the best confidence in the process. And that's uh, it for today. Um, I think we went a little bit over in time, but I uh, hope uh, answered a lot of questions. Yeah, that's all right. All good stuff, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you. A uh, couple questions here. Um, this was towards the beginning of the presentation. Uh, Brittany comments, viscosity at what shear rate? Uh, that really depends uh, on the product. So not sure okay. to give you a correct answer. Usually we're talking three to 10,000 centipoise. Um, so regular flowing material, like regular paint. Mm -hmm. But it, it's application specific, yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, she asks another question. How would we know if our particles are destroyed? Yeah, well, that's a good question. You could look it under the microscope. Uh, so that's where you would maybe see that you're destroying your pigment particles. Um, okay. Also, if you know, you're not really, if you're just right, milling regularly, this is more with that comes into play with the fake pigments. Like we see that with silvers and those metallic flakes, uh, you would absolutely see it in the application process. Uh, when you are, let's say, spraying out a panel, and you no longer have good flake orientation or instead of it being silver, it looks gray or you're not getting the right color. That usually is indicative of having the uh, an issue with your uh, particles. Uh, so application parameters as well as uh, my electronic microscope to identify uh, if something had gone wrong. OK, uh, another couple of questions we'll, we'll breeze through here. Uh, do all beads in the media mail have to be the same size or can it be a variety of sizes? No, they should all be the same size because if they have different sizes, your kinetic energies are different. And what happens is the bigger beads will wear down your smaller beads much faster. Mm -hmm. And then you have very uneven processing parameters and you can't really replicate that uh, entire trial again uh, if you don't know, uh, you know how your beads are wearing. It's, you always want to use one, one standard bead size. Also, for smaller beads, you need a different screen size. And if you have varying uh, media sizes, it's difficult to dial in the proper screen. Otherwise, you can clock the screen if your screen is too large for the larger particles. If you have smaller, um, uh, so, so, sorry, small, larger beads, if you have smaller beads, then they could clock that larger screen so that would not be advisable then you don't have any flow of your mill, slurry through the milling chamber or, or basket okay yeah totally makes sense uh last one here from tim uh what are the pluses and minuses of a basket mill relative to a three-roll mill first of all safety right uh three-roll mills are not very safe uh, i mean they have done some design changes um I would say uh, maybe cleaning. It's very easy to clean a basket mill. I can maybe do a, you know, a quick job in about five to ten minutes, and maybe thirty minutes to properly clean it. I don't know different three roll mill designs, but they're just kind of a bit more of a, you know, challenge sometimes to really clean them properly. I think a basket mill is very easy, easy to clean. Um, okay. I don't know about cooling, but I would say probably uh, cooling. You have really good cooling with the basket mill because of the double wall, and we are also cooling our supply vessel. So that might be an aspect. Um, um, it would be good. I don't know. You know, it depends on some materials, but we have a lot of people moving away from three roll mills, and they they like to have uh, you know good good safe milling. Uh, down to really small particle size. So they, if they can, they use a, a basket mill. 
Nice. And uh, like Andy mentioned too, we, we have a facility in Wallingford and Andy, you're there today, right? Is that right? I'm here, I'm here today. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So for uh, visiting, running any trials, doing any tests, um, we're available for that. Um, if you have any questions that you think of after the fact, uh, just hit reply to any of the automated marketing messages you get. Uh, myself or one of my colleagues will get that and we'll funnel it uh, to Andy or the appropriate person. Um, so with that, I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, appreciate your time, Andy, and expertise as always. Uh, thank you to the attendees. Um, hope you learned something today. And we look forward to seeing you on a future Bit Gardener uh, web seminar. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.